I love you with everything I am. In the early 2000s, the search for Prince Charming is repackaged for the new millennium. Bada bing, The Bachelor. It's all a romantic fairy tale. It's easy to fall in love because they set it up. It's a perfect date. It's a perfect situation. But one where competition, not love, conquers all. That's when you could start to puppet master the girls. And I'm just asking you, come spend the night with me. It's a game of roses with a lot of pricks. Then we look for herpes free bodies. That becomes a modern day tragedy. As someone who's not mentally strong, it wears on you. What put her over the edge was just the raw criticism. If you don't want to be on television, then don't be on television. In 2002, what will become one of TV's longest running reality shows, The Bachelor, debuts. It's got everything romance and roses, conflicts and cat fights, We're fake as can be, hope and heartbreak. <laughs> the Bachelor is a worldwide phenomenon with versions everywhere from the UK and Vietnam to Australia Wait. and Africa. The series is the brainchild of American television producer Mike Fleiss, whose previous credits include 1997's World's Scariest Police Shootouts. On tape, this is not a movie. Everything you are about to see is real. So I don't know if it's lowbrow or if it's trashy TV or whatever, but I think the shows that I make, they're, people are rarely confused by what it's about. Mike Fleiss is an absolute character. He was the anti-executive, showing up at the office, T-shirt, flip-flops, you know what I mean? Just like the wackiest, coolest, like you would never, ever think he was a, a, a network executive, let alone the creator of The Bachelor. I'm Marky Costello, and in the 2000s, I cast one of the most prolific reality shows on television to this day, The Bachelor. Mike was sometimes scary, but, you know, brilliantly scary. Mike is the second cousin of famed Hollywood madam, Heidi Fleiss. Not not guilty to all charges. Mike's cousin was prosecuted for pandering back in the early 90s. It's illegal in one place, legal other places, and it could be, you could say it as a prostitute, but it's really, maybe some of these girls want to marry these men. Here they are, our 50 beautiful contestants. Heidi's rationale may be the inspiration a decade later for Mike's Who Wants to Marry a Multimillionaire, a TV show that ends with a live wedding between total strangers. People say to you, when this will be the, the most watched wedding since uh, Charles and Diana. Contestant number 40. The spectacle of 50 wannabe trophy wives battling to marry Rick Rockwell, an unknown rich guy, is so salacious it's sparking controversy before it even airs. So this whole concept makes sense to you? Hmm. We shouldn't be talking about challenging the concept, I don't think. And on February 15, 2001, announcer Mark Thompson introduces the provocative show. 50 women from all parts of the globe have gathered here at the Las Vegas Hilton, hoping to marry our mysterious multi-millionaire. More than 22 million people tune in to watch. Semi-finalist number two from Thousand Oaks, California, Darva Hunger. It was just insane. The show was bigger than a Marvel movie. The Congo, will you marry me? But the spectacle isn't over. Soon after breathlessly saying, I do, the newly minted Mrs. Rockwell begins screaming, I don't. What happened was Darva wanted out immediately. Then Rockwell's ex-girlfriend reveals she filed a restraining order against him, claiming he assaulted her, claims he denies. But Darva got an annulment and a media blitz began. Fox blames Fleiss for failing to do a background check on Rockwell. But all ABC sees are the huge ratings from Who Wants to Marry a Multimillionaire 
and hires Fleiss to create a reimagined version of that show called The Bachelor. When we started that first season of The Bachelor, we all believed in the hope and possibility of two people meeting on the show and falling in love. I'm Jason Carbone, and in the 2000s, I was part of the most successful dating show in the history of television. Carbone is brought on to direct The Bachelor, and for Fleiss's right hand, he hires Lisa Levinson. Lisa Levinson is an incredibly talented producer. Her producing style will later inspire a lead character on Lifetime Channel's Unreal. Oh, Mary. Sad, dried up, single mother Mary. A scripted okay, show about the behind the scenes goings on at a bacheloresque dating reality series run by an amoral producer. All right, everyone, give me some bitch interviews now. We had lots of tactics about how to make a girl cry on camera. Everyone had their own shtick. I learned mine from Lisa Levinson. You had to go for like their hot buttons. Their dad left them when they were eight years old. They got uh, left at the altar. And that's how it is if you want to be on The Bachelor. <laughs> you're gonna cry while you're here. And if you don't cry enough, we're gonna find a way to get you out. And then we're gonna make you cry when you leave because you didn't get The Bachelor. So you better cry. I'm Michael Carroll. In the 2000s, I was a rock star reality TV producer on The Bachelor. But before production starts on season one, Fleiss needs to find a real life Prince Charming, one that meets ABC's stringent list of requirements. Uh, I modeled in my 20s. He had to be handsome, he had to be smart, he had to be educated. You know, he had to be the ultimate bachelor, you know, that babe, that hunk, that catch, where women would be like, oh my God. At the end of this season, we literally need a man to get down on his knee and propose. I am definitely looking for the right one. We were looking for America's most eligible bachelor, if you will. But the casting tapes they receive are mostly duds. To the outrageous. I have a bunny. There's 25 beautiful ladies who are basically there in search of a man like me. One guy literally sent us a dick pic before dick pics were dick pics. Like, I mean, the craziest shit we would get. Costello's team spends months submitting the best of the worst to ABC for approval. We would have to lay out pictures and we would write a little bio on each one. Uh, you know, this is a great guy from New England. His family owns, you know, a butter churning company. He's, you know, worth $300 million. He has a yacht, he has this, he has that. And because of Fleiss's fiasco with who wants to marry a multimillionaire, there are things The Bachelor can't have. Everybody had uh, a psych evaluation. Everybody had background checks that were conducted by people that used to work for the FBI. And there's also the dreaded medical exam. Well, there was a great bachelor that we absolutely fell in love with. And I won't mention his name, but we lost him to herpes. And it was a very sad day. <laughs> Ultimately, a friend of ours who was casting on Survivor sent us a tape and said, oh, I think I might have the perfect guy for you. So Alex Michelle, who was our first Bachelor, was actually a rejected contestant from Survivor. On paper, the network loves Alex Michelle. He's 31, single, and has degrees from both Harvard and Stanford. They fell in love with his pedigree, but... He might need to lose a couple pounds. He might need to whiten his teeth. He might need to do this. He might need to do that. So I put him up in a hotel, got him a personal trainer, put him on the zone diet, sent him to a dentist to get his teeth bleached. Bada bing, there is The Bachelor. Hey, Alex, good to see you again. How are you feeling? Now we really started on the women. Women from all over the country sent in tapes hoping they Mike might Fleiss be loved beautiful blondes. For Mr. Ryan. So we were looking for women that were smart, beautiful, educated, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. They don't want fat. They don't want ugly. They don't want pimples. You know, they want someone that is visually appealing. But to host the show, 
Fleiss wants a nondescript nobody. Not a big name. It's not about the host. Whoever we go with is someone who is just going to fly under the radar. They find just who they're looking for on a soon-to-be-canceled game show being shot in a Minnesota shopping mall. Thank you very much. Welcome to Mall Masters at Mall of America. Chris Harrison. I hate to break Chris Harrison's bubble, but the show is about the man and the women. Women who get grilled on every little detail of their private lives. Have you ever done any nude things, anything we should know about? Not that it's a problem, but just... Yeah, I've been in Playboy. Playboy. We would create these boards that had a little backstory, a picture. You know, she just recently went through a breakup. She just got over anorexia. You know, she has been a bridesmaid 15 times, but never a bride, you know? She's gonna f somebody on day one. You know what I mean? She's a virgin, she's never gonna f you know? Like, that's the reality. They wanna know what the f is gonna happen in that house with those girls. Producers will then take that intel and wield it like a weapon. And just like bringing up things that don't need to be brought up and just wrecking them, you know, psychologically. It's all designed to deliver the emotional collapse the show will soon demand. They said, I mean, your dad had an affair and your best friend killed herself. Cheers. Yeah. Let's kick things off with- Over the decades, dating shows have been one of TV's go-to formats. Let's bring her on stage right now. Beginning in the 1960s, the dating game even featured some pre-fame celebrities, including Farrah Fawcett, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Suzanne Somers, and perhaps the worst catch ever, an active serial killer posing as a photographer. I got a PhD in clinical psychology. I'm an attorney and... Almost four decades later, what will become TV's most successful dating show spends almost 12 months casting its first episode to air on ABC. Well, Would you recommend I go on it? You're in. What about the herpes issue? I have no herpes. Herpes free. I, I mean, I just got checked. Being STD free matters because The Bachelor is meant to be all about love and marriage. And Bad Boy executive producer Mike Fleiss expects a proposal on the finale. Alex, you ready? Ready as I'll ever be. Well, really, the easy part is going to be meeting these 25 women. The formula is what was so fascinating, right? All of these women vying for one guy, one dude, right? Each week, The Bachelor, Alex Michelle, will give a rose to the women he's still interested in while sending home the rest. But that first night, while hope still springs eternal, all 25 women are loaded into limos and served alcohol for hours while the cameras get set up. They're just sitting in there drinking champagne until they're blotto. And A, there's nowhere for them to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so all the beautiful girls, 25, they have to get out of the car and pee on the side of the road in their gown. Fantastic. It's because why didn't we get them a porta potty? I, I don't know what happened. So um, that's what happened. Liquor isn't just relegated to the limos, there's plenty backstage in the control room. There's a giant wall of monitors. The executive producers, Mike Fleiss, Lisa Levinson, and the director, Jason Carbone, are all sitting on the front line. And on the table was a bottle of Patron, and they would take shots, they would drink beers. If you came into the control room as a producer, Mike Fleiss would be like, you want a beer? Have a beer, loosen up. With Mike Fleiss, he absolutely knew what he wanted, and he had no qualms asking us to give it to him. And what Fleiss wants is for his two favorites to get a rose. Amanda, who happened to be blonde, big boobed, bubbly, and Trista. Mike loved Trista. Alex sees things differently. I definitely have a couple early favorites. Kathy and Kim, they're awesome. Even though Amanda and Trista aren't on Alex's radar, he doesn't seem to be the one calling the shots. Amanda. Every rose ceremony, there was an argument between Mike Fleiss and Lisa Levinson and ABC The Network. Trista. About which chicks, which girls should get roses and which should go home. That was a fight every time. But there's one thing everyone agrees on, they need to appear inclusive. Lenice. 
If you look at all of the contestants, there's one black girl, Lenise. Will you accept this rose? Gladly. That's right, just one out of 25. Why were there more people of color on the show? I, I, I can't answer that one. As far as our mandate on diversity, it was not huge. On March 25th, 2002, The Bachelor premieres on ABC. Your beachfront TV critics pan it, calling it debasing, desperate, depressing, dull, and dopey. When I stare at him, it makes my stomach just drop or something. It's the end of the world. The reality is, is that The Bachelor is fundamentally kind of mean. Those of you who did not receive a rose tonight, take a moment and say your goodbyes. You know, 24 women get their heart broken, but if you don't want to be on television, then don't be on television. You have all these hopes that someone's going to see something. Viewers seem to love watching hearts get broken. Just one deep breath, please. 9.9 .9 million people watched the debut episode of The Bachelor. I had made enough reality television at that point to know the difference between uh, a hit and a so-so show. And I knew while we were shooting that we had a hit on our hands. That's because the formula nails the dating tropes. There's a Rodeo Drive shopping spree. Well, guess what? The store is yours today. <laughs> or what the producers call the pretty woman date. It was literally a Julia Roberts fantasy and we kind of dismissed the notion that she was a hooker. There's a cliche gondola kiss with Lenise. And the green-eyed monster tags along on a group date. All right, am I squishing you? No, are you kidding? You're light as a feather. Tensions and ratings build to the finale when Alex, perhaps unsurprisingly, ends up choosing between Mike Fleiss's original favorites, Amanda and Trista. It hurts me a lot to say goodbye to you. I'm really sorry. I was blown away that he picked Amanda over Trista, but it goes to show those big boobs won over the small boobs. But the real winner is ABC. The Bachelor finale grows to double the first episode's ratings, over 18 million viewers. Holy moly, like, I know I never, ever, ever would have thought it would be as big as it was. I'm gonna hold on to it. Especially considering Alex Michelle wrecks the happily ever after ending by not proposing to Amanda. Before we walk down the aisle together, I wanna make sure that we feel the same way about each other outside of the fantasy world of mansions and limos. Of course, of course. After the show, Alex and Amanda hit the red carpets. But they break up when Amanda discovers Alex is still in touch with Trista. Still, The Bachelor and ABC are a match made in heaven. And casting soon starts on season two. The show is called The Bachelor, but the women are really the stars. So picking the right 25 women is very important. And the producers have this developed season. a formula by now. Stick to the archetypes. We needed a bimbo, like a kind of a hoe. Where are your panties? Did you leave them in the limo? We needed a, a ditzy girl that everyone could make fun of. Oh, oh, my guy, I really hope you don't testify. Good luck. And they always want a good time girl who's got it and is not afraid to flaunt it. I mean, they cast a 23-year-old for a reason. I had great boobs and a great butt back then, so why don't you expose it? <laughs> I'm Kelly Jo Higgins, and I was on season four of The Bachelor. Yeah. Kelly Jo's pursuit of Bachelor Bob Guinea is helped along by two producers who prod her to get the first kiss. Oh my God. They you? both came out and they're like, okay, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna take Bob back by the pool and you guys are just gonna have your little conversation and then just lay it on him. Am I gonna get a kiss? Oh, oh of course. <laughs> I always dish those out of the first pool side. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But following the producer's advice makes Kelly Joe a target for a nasty blogger calling himself Reality Steve. 
And because Kelly Joe rhymes with, you know, Kelly Ho, it ended up being kind of my tagline for a bit. And I was like, okay, just from a smooch, thank God I didn't fully make out with him. But still, there are worse things you can be called on The Bachelor. Oh, the title of the villain. <laughs> my name's Trish Schneider. I was on season five of The Bachelor. That season features 25-year-old New York Giants backup quarterback Jesse Palmer finally getting a chance to throw passes. In 2004, I was the original Bachelor villain. Trish, a professional model, rubs the other women the wrong way as soon as she unpacks. The infamous gold digger t-shirt. Everyone's like, I can't believe she wore that t-shirt and blah, blah, blah. It's just my, you know, sense of humor. She was a fantastic TV and really easy to produce. And by easy to produce, I mean, that's when you could start to puppet master the girls into saying what you wanted. And if that fails, the producers use the old standby, booze. I did have, you know, a couple of drinks. It's like without food, you know, and you drink these drinks, it gets to you. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure they purposely tried to get contestants drunk. It's like truth serum in a situation like The Bachelor. So yes, of course, I think alcohol played a part of some people being either more comfortable in front of the camera or willing to share more. Alcohol also plays a part in what happens behind the cameras. As a producer, it was your job to drink. So there'd be times if you didn't have a drink on hand, Mike Fleiss would get mad at you because he thought you weren't having as much fun as the, as the cast. So doing that all day and, you know, all year, all every month of your job makes you kind of an alcoholic. <laughs> I drank so much on that show and then years after that eventually I gave it up because I was just, I, I couldn't live life normally anymore. Like if your job is to drink, it kind of creates issues, you know? And Mike Fleiss, feeling you're not having a good enough time can be scary, even for the show's Prince Charming. I was one of the worst bachelors ever because I just wasn't comfortable. And I was terrified, but I said yes. And next thing I knew, it got even more terrifying. At the start of the 2000s, Jennifer Aniston is showing off a half million dollar engagement ring designed by future ex-husband Brad Pitt. For beautiful young women across the country, green with envy, The Bachelor offers a chance to color their world. He's everything I've ever wanted in a man. I feel like I am completely falling in love. I feel like I'm head over heels. Which is easy to do when the show's producers are flying you to an Alaskan glacier. chartering private yachts, <laughs> and dangling a two-carat carrot in front of you. So why don't you try this one on? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This yeah. is beautiful. It's easy to fall in love because they set it up. It's a perfect date. It's a perfect situation. It put them in the headspace of a fairy tale land to where they're like, wow, my life with this person is going to be like this every day. It's all part of the producer's master plan. They call it the Bachelor bubble. The Bachelor people, they know what they're doing. Creating the perfect bubble begins before shooting starts. Hotel TVs and phones are stripped from the cast rooms. And after the women check in, producers don't give them any keys. Awesome. You're not allowed to leave the room. They don't want you commingling. They don't want you really to see anybody. Everyone's luggage, if your contestant is, you know, searched. Everything bad's taken out. And bad meaning cell phones, computers, drugs, magazines, books. There's no TV, there's no news, there's no music, there's no, I mean, there's nothing. Nothing. No pen. You can't write anything down. You can't do anything. No, you can't pick up the phone and call your mom. Wow. This way, the women chosen on night one move into their villa with zero distractions. Ladies, if you would, please join. But even though they're in the bubble, they're definitely not alone here. Somebody is just always in your face with a camera. 
you guys got engaged. We had crews on 24 hours a day. There was always somebody at the mansion the ladies lived in. Constant surveillance and scrutiny help fuel rivalries. We know who the competition is, so based on that, you can kind of figure out who he might pick. You're the only one that I know that is so sure. Yeah, yeah. seriously. And narrows everyone's attention. You only have one main focus and really one thing to talk about, The Bachelor. It's just nonstop. It was like a bobblehead of, oh, this is how I feel about Bob, and this is how I feel. It was just, it, it got really repetitive. I want him to be my husband. The Bachelor yeah. bubble immediately makes, you know, psychologically these women, you know, idol worship. The more I'm around him, I like the guy. Yeah, as time goes on, it just unfortunately. If anything, it's raised my standards so much in guys. Really? He is so fun. So they all, all of a sudden go, ooh, I'm gonna really compete to get this dude. It is a surreal situation that is set up every single day, every single date, every single interview is to create an emotion. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? It's a great thing for entertainment. Is it good psychologically and sociologically? I, I doubt it. Either way, the bachelor bubble works on Kelly Joe. Because I know I wouldn't be in love with you if I didn't feel something back from you. And it feels good. I knew for sure without a doubt that Bob was going to choose me. It was real to me, like I felt like I was falling in love with him. But in the finale, however, the bubble bursts. I don't know that we're meant to be together. Are you all right? No, <laughs> not at all. Bob breaks up with Kelly Jo. Right now I'm so sad, my heart is broken. And he ends up giving Estella, the last woman standing, a promise ring. If someone wears a ring on their right hand, it can mean a sense of promise. A promise ring? I would have been like, buddy, come on. <laughs> Although it's a Harry Winston promise ring, so I probably would have taken it. <laughs> but on the next season of The Bachelor, it's executive producer Mike Fleiss's turn to be upset when Bachelor Jesse refuses to give show villain and fan favorite Trish a rose. Mike said to me, we got to figure out a way to keep her on the show. She's the best thing we've got this season. And I looked at Mike and I said, but she's just gotten eliminated. How do we keep her on the show? I was told to figure it out. Luckily for Jason, Trish also wants to stay on the show. And I was like, just, you know, let me just show up and have a conversation with him. But merely talking with Jesse doesn't work for the producers. They demand something more titillating. That's where the room key comes in. They said, listen, here's the deal. Like, we're giving you this. You have to give us something in return. They'll let Trish return after her elimination, but only if she asks Jesse to spend the night with her. We were looking for a television moment, and we absolutely got it. And I'm just asking you, come spend the night with me. Let's have a couple more hours. Don't say anything. I'm going to give this to you. Everyone was so, like, shocked. Like, oh, she gave a room key. Oh, my gosh. It was part of the plan. I wouldn't have given him a room key. But for the show, the producers were like, we give you this, you give us this. And so with that, I was able to give Mike what he was looking for. Which in turn gives Jason job security. As a producer on The Bachelor, if you were great at making a contestant cry or stirring up drama, you were staying on the TV show. So that's what you did. You fake sympathy and go for the jugular. <laughs> so it's like, this was your big shot. I mean, you were, you were here for a reason and we were all rooting for you. Everyone was. Do you, did, you kind of let yourself down, but you let us down. It hurts my feelings. It hurts it's my heart. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I would wish this on my worst enemy. What have I done wrong? What did I do to deserve this? I'm not going to be OK. Insecurities come up as, as a female now, and I am not pretty enough. I'm not worthy. I wasn't interesting. I'm never going to find a man. Name it. It was, it was kind of awful. <laughs> but effective, according to former contestant Kim Sullivan, who has this to say about her exit interview. And finally they said, 
I mean, your dad had an affair and your best friend killed herself. So this is just one more thing that you can add to your list of disappointments. This face says it all. But while crying on screen might last just a few moments, appearing on The Bachelor can cause lasting damage. It took about a year to really recover work-wise. I mean, my clients were just that we can't book you. You're too recognizable. You're too, you know, it. we just can't. We love you, but we just can't book you right now. A big financial hit for Trish, who, like the other women, doesn't get paid to be on The Bachelor. I think really only The Bachelor gets paid a specific amount, or if you're the principal, which is kind of not fair. <laughs> especially since the women must take six weeks off work and supply their own wardrobe. That's an entire suitcase of shoes. I know the girls in my season didn't get paid either, and I know one actually sold her car to buy dresses to come on the show, which I felt awful about. I'm Lorenz Borghese, and in the 2000s, I was The Bachelor season nine Rome. The Eternal City, my second home, where the word romance was born. A couple of seasons after mine, they came out with a poll, and I was voted the worst Bachelor ever, and I'm okay with it. ABC initially jumps at the chance to cast Prince Lorenzo Borghese as The Bachelor because he's from a legit royal family. They said, oh, you're, you know, this prince from Italy, and you live in New York, and you're single. And I knew they were going to play up on it, and they did. And I got burned for it. ABC feels they did, too. I don't even think you can see my season anymore. I think ABC pulled it. <laughs> and, uh, but I always said, when I would do interviews, I said, if I'm the worst bachelor, I accept that with a smile because it just means I'm really bad at lying to girls and dating 25 at one time. But season nine isn't the only thing ABC and the bachelor producers are trying to hide. I was being asked such things as if I had ever had anal or oral sex. Ladies, Jason, it's the final rose tonight. When you're ready. ABC's The Bachelor is a massive hit. It has millions of fans who proudly identify as part of the Bachelor Nation. But the show has also become a favorite punchline, <laughs> including for David Spade on funnierdie.com. Wow, I see so much desperation in this room. It's made my dick shrink up a little bit. And SNL roasts the boring and bland man cast as The Bachelor. My name is Dan, and I'm from Chicago or Denver or something. I have blue eyes, brown hair, and gray shirt. But ABC gets the last laugh. After eight seasons, The Bachelor still gets almost 10 million viewers a week. I just remember all the girls talking about The Bachelor, but I never watched one season. I maybe watched maybe a couple minutes of, of an episode, and I, I couldn't stand it. But a little ego stroking by producers goes a long way. It was like, you know, well, you're the hero of the show. Like, this show's about you. And I'm like, this is actually pretty cool. Like, uh, you know, and they convinced me that this is, this is, you know, about me. It's my own show, and it's on a major network. But when the entire production moves to Italy, where Lorenzo has never lived, the reality of what he signed up for finally hits him. We're filming a commercial for the season. I said, OK, you know, you would think you'd get training for this, but they don't train you on any of it. And they give me a rose. It's a whole movie set in the middle of Rome, and thousands of people are watching this movie set as I come out of my trailer. I've got to walk with this rose down this block when this, with this camera on tracks is following me. It was one of the most embarrassing things I've ever done. I was born into a royal family. But I returned to Rome on a journey or the one thing family, royalty, and money can't buy. I didn't like cameras, and it was very awkward. The Bachelor Rome. I wanted to get out of it. I really did. I, if, if I could have gotten a release, I would have signed it. But I knew I was doomed. I knew I'd signed up for it. I, I have no choice. And the contract you signed when you agreed to be on The Bachelor allows producers to violate your right to privacy, cause emotional distress, and portray you in a false light. 
I felt like I wasn't in control of my life. So I was in mental prison because I couldn't do what I wanted to do. But the producers can, including taking everything you say in your interviews and editing it any way they want to make it sound like you said things you didn't. You just find a way to make what you want for the edit happen by chopping up all the things they've said because we own every word they say, no matter what order we put it in. Unreal, the fictional series based on The Bachelor, depicts how far producers can push it. This house is full of amazing women. There's no backstabbing, nobody's calling each other liars. We all feel blessed, especially me. That's backstabbing liar, liars. Bless. This house is full of backstabbing liars, especially me. Damn, we're good. Yes, we are. That does not sit well with me. You know, at least give me a fighting chance. We're making content. We're making entertainment. At the end of the day, everybody knows what they've signed up for. And when the episodes finally air, there's hate and bullying from the viewers to contend with. I mean, people can be really ugly about things. I'd get physical letters, and the majority were really negative, say, like, I'm, I'm a disgrace to my family. How could I pick a used woman over the virgin? The Catholic Church must be furious at me. Like, really crazy things. You stupid punk ass bitch. If I After ever... years of ignoring the problem, the Bachelor tries to stop the vitriol by addressing it openly on an episode of its companion show, The Women Tell All. How many of you have faced true hate? Not criticism, true hate. That's 100% of you. But it's too little and 18 years too late for Lenise the sole black contestant in season one. When I started to see the racist stuff online about who does that black girl think she is, he's never going to pick her. I was like, wait, what? Like. The bullying was so intense, Lenise turned to pills and was hospitalized. <laughs> but she's considered one of the lucky ones. Lots of questions today about the tragic death of former Bachelor contestant Gina Aleman. I love you. Will you make me the happiest man? After over two decades on the air, there's no denying ABC's The Bachelor is one of the most successful television series ever. The reason The Bachelor endures, because at its core, it's a love story. And everybody wants to fall in love. I love you with everything that I am. Will you marry me? Yes, yes. But let's also be realistic. You know, people want drama. Hey, Please what? stop interrupting me. <laughs> or People love watching the train wreck. I wish more than anything that last day you would have just let me go instead of doing this to me. But after all the turmoil and unhappy endings, executive producer Mike Fleiss finally gets the results he's always wanted when John Lowe proposes to Catherine Guidici. Yes. It's the first time ever The Bachelor marries the woman who received the final rose, and it only took 17 seasons. You may kiss her wow. Kudos to you, Mike Fleiss. Kudos to you. The show's phenomenal success right from the start leads ABC to spin it off into The Bachelorette, Bachelor Pad, Bachelor in Paradise, and many others. And these shows make The Bachelor look like family-friendly entertainment. Hold on to your coconuts. No. It's like watching a train wreck. That was a hit. On Bachelor Pad, bullying is all part of the fun. Like when men are asked to throw paint at the least attractive women. Erica taking a beating down here. Then you are incredible, you are amazing, you are beautiful, and you know that, you know that. There's also trouble in paradise when two on-set producers lodge formal complaints regarding a female contestant being too drunk to give sexual consent. Demario Jackson, accused of sexually assaulting Corinne Olympios during a taping, 
The production shut down during the investigation. DeMario was ultimately cleared of any misconduct. And cheers to paradise, bitches. But for the first time ever, the Bachelor in Paradise bar is no longer all you can drink. The cast is back in Mexico filming the new season, but with new rules in place. According to a new report, one of those rules is a two drink per hour max. And on The Bachelorette, Becky Steenhoek, a former segment producer, alleges five other producers sexually harassed her on set. Um, I was being asked such things as if I had ever had anal or oral sex, um, how I, how I um, shaved myself. And while critics accuse the Bachelor franchises of being morally bankrupt, it has made a lot of people very rich, including creator Mike Fleiss. My favorite part about casting The Bachelor, I would say, it bought me my house in the Palisades. <laughs> but many former cast members are paying the price for being on the show some with their lives. Lots of questions today about the tragic death of former Bachelor contestant Gia Aleman. Dead by suicide, her fan favorite Gia, Bachelorette contestant Julian Hug, and The Bachelor's Lex McAllister, whose friend and co-worker blames the show. How did being rejected by The Bachelor on national TV contribute to her emotional state? She didn't take criticism very well, and she hid it very well. And if I was to guess at what put her over the edge was just the raw criticism the world has done to that poor girl. Even if cast members have mental health issues prior to being on the show, being brainwashed, manipulated, gaslit, rejected, and ridiculed by internet trolls is bound to take its toll. You know, to someone who's not mentally strong, it wears on you. How on earth could people have accepted this and? thought that it was just normal. Some don't. Bachelor and Bachelorette alum Caitlin Bristow claims Mike Fleiss hates women, a statement she made even before security camera footage leaks of Fleiss allegedly assaulting his wife. Laura, the 2012 Miss America winner, claims the alleged attack happened after her husband demanded she get an abortion. She's 10 weeks pregnant with her second child. Fleiss denies the attack, but pays his wife $10 million in the separation agreement. She then drops the charges and they reconcile. Meanwhile, Bachelor Nation seems as strong as ever. It's escapism. I can escape my day and get into these crazy bitches' lives for a second, you know? It's like a cult following. I mean, there's people that are like, I've watched every single season, every single episode. <laughs> like, wow, I don't watch it anymore in a really long time. After decades of lawsuits, scandals, petitions, and accusations of sexism, on the night of the season 27 finale, Bachelor creator Mike Fleiss, seemingly out of nowhere, announces he's stepping down. But it turns out Fleiss didn't jump. He was pushed. Earlier this week, Warner Brothers Television conducted an investigation after several employees, including current producers, as well as former production staffers, lodged complaints against Fleiss. The allegations of not only bullying, but also racism, may have finally caught up with Fleiss. Still, the Bachelor franchise shows no signs of slowing down or fundamentally changing. Sometimes what we do to the contestants is disturbing to you as a producer, just wrecking them, you know, psychologically. But then the next season, somehow I'd, I'd turn around and be like, I don't give a shit. Did I feel conflicted on The Bachelor? Not really, but that said, would I want my daughter to be on the show? Hell no. What does that mean? I'll let the audience who watches this decide. <laughs>